Thanks a lot, Dr. Mosley. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending. I'm pretty bad at introducing myself, but I'm from Italy, as you might guess from my accent. Uh, I graduated from the University of Pisa in 1992, worked in practice for about 12 years, uh, did a non-conforming cardiology internship at the University of Turin and the CVIM uh, conforming cardiology residency between the University of Illinois and Oregon State University, and then I've been on faculty for three years at Kansas State University, and I'm here. Very happy to be here. Uh, so the cardiac workup. Um, there is a lot uh, that uh, um, a trained technician can do. What we're going to do here is just talk about a few aspects, because I only have 45 minutes. Um, but mainly cardiac auscultation and non-invasive blood pressure and obtaining a, um, a diagnostic ECG is, um, is probably the foundation and the core of what can be done as part of the cardiovascular workup in patients suspects for cardiac disease or, or with a confirmed cardiac disease. And uh, here we see out of all of the aspects of the cardiovascular evaluation, only three are uh, be covered today. Uh, there would be way more to talk about, but we will need much more time and perhaps we'll do it in the future. Uh, what does it take to uh, achieve a successful auscultation? Um, so auscultation is cheap, it's, uh, but it's virtually the most important single step in evaluating a patient suspect for cardiac disease. Uh, still now, in 2010, with all of the fancy uh, electronic devices we use for diagnostic purposes, uh, the most common cause for a referral is the identification of a heart murmur. To perform a successful auscultation, you need to be in a quiet environment. Even the most skilled cardiologists can't do much. There is too much background noise. So try to make it clear. You know, if you don't feel comfortable ask, uh, listening to a heart in, 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 of a dog in a, in a place that is too noisy, just move somewhere else. And uh, you know, it's a, it's a cheap thing to do. It takes a bit of time, but it, it improves the overall outcome of the, of the diagnostic procedure. Stick with your own good old stethoscope, like I like to call it. I wouldn't feel comfortable grading a murmur using someone else's stethoscope. There is a significant difference. And uh, so get the good one and stick with that. Get used to it and most importantly, use it. Anytime you're required, requested to grade a murmur, make sure you do it with your own stethoscope or in a stethoscope you're comfortable, comfortable with. Of course, in take some sufficient training, but uh, be beyond that, a systematic approach is fundamental. Um, make sure you listen to both hemithoraxes, and you go from the apex of the heart, the base, the sternal and parasternal areas, and all the way up to the axillary location, and we'll see what I mean by saying that. A few words on stethoscopes. Um, there are two ma major uh, forms of stethoscopes. So there is a dual head stethoscope, which has a bell on one side and a diaphragm on the other side. The bell is used to emphasize low, high frequency sound, sorry, excuse me, low frequency sounds. Uh, it's great for gallops, for instance, or triple cadences. Diaphragm, the diaphragm does emphasize high frequency sounds. Then, over the past few years, uh, so-called single head pressure sensitive stethoscopes have been derived, have been developed and applied, and are fairly popular. Uh, without pressure, you simulate the bell mode, low pressure, low frequency, and by applying some pressure, you simulate the diaphragm mode that emphasizes high frequency heart sounds. Then there is the confusing du dual head pressure sensitive stethoscope that is pretty much two pressure sensitive stethoscopes in one. You have a larger and a smaller head, and they both can simulate bell function and diaphragm function. What are the traditional areas of auscultation? We all know that on the left hemithorax, the, at the apex of the heart, we hear mitral events. At the base of the heart, we hear aortic and pulmonic events. While on the right side of the, of the chest, uh, we mainly uh, focus on uh, events that occur around the tricuspid valve. However, what is important to remember is that there is a huge overlapping of the pulmonary and aortic areas of auscultation to the point where if you ask a cardiologist, can you differentiate pulmonic stenosis versus aortic stenosis just based on the location of the murmur, most will say no. And I'm one of those. Um, the pulmonic area and the aortic area probably overlap for at least 50% of their surfaces. 
So don't try to differentiate pulmonic versus aortic events just based on the location. Uh, then keep in mind that uh, if you don't move cranial dorsal to these two areas of auscultation, you get really wedged into the axilla. Uh, you may miss some time, some types of PDAs, so patent doctor's arteriosis, which is a fairly common congenital heart defect. The abnor vascular abnormality is right here at the level of the aortic arch, far away from the apex of the heart. So if you just listen to the apex in a puppy, you may miss a very important diagnosis because it's a fixable disease and can be completely cured if, if, if diagnosed on time. Um, there's an old say that if you only get to listen in one spot in a puppy, listen to the base. And if you only get to listen in one spot in an adult dog, listen to the apex. And that's just based on the, you know, the predisposition and kind of uh, just playing the odds. What's, what's an adult is going to have? It's going to have mitral valve disease, so it's going to be an apical event. But many puppies that have cardiac events that are only audible if you go as cranial and as dorsal as the muscles of the forearm will let you do. Why are cats so difficult to auscultate? Well, their cats are cats, so are always more difficult than any other species. That's why we love them. And uh, they are smaller. No surprise, although some cats are much bigger than many tiny dogs. Um, the areas of auscultation are very close to each other. Um, this is the size of my stethoscope. How can I differentiate an apical event versus a basilar event if my stethoscope is almost as big as the heart? So we just don't do it. We just don't even try. The position of the heart changes over, over time. And uh, this is a young cat, and this is an older cat. So the heart becomes more parallel to the sternum with aging. And thereby, you know, it's hard to know where, the, where is the base, unless you have radiographs to compare with, which you usually don't have at the time in which you're listening to your cat. Um, gallop heart sounds can be hard to detect because are low frequency heart sounds. And if you forget to use the bell or the bell function of your stethoscope, you may just plain miss them. And then the other reason why cats are always difficult is because honestly, Pretty much all murmurs sound the same. So being able to differentiate, to diagnose a condition just based on auscultation in cats is way more difficult than in dogs. Another reason why cats are difficult is that because sometimes we forget to listen to their sternal area. 90% at least of audible events in cats are not right here, but you, you can hear them if you're very ventral. What I, put in, what I do most of the time in cats, I start right on the sternum and I go front and cranial and more caudal, and then I slip to the left of the sternum and to the right of the sternum. Because believe me, but most murmurs in cats are going to be either external or parasternal in location. So that if you listen to where you believe the base of the heart is, you will easily miss them. The most important thing to do is uh, to develop a systematic approach. And a systematic approach uh, can be your own personal systematic approach and be per perfectly fine. I'm just showing you mine, and uh, then you can adapt it to, to your practice. Uh, usually what I do when I, when I start listening to a patient, I start feeling the chest. And where, wherever I feel the heart hitting the chest, that's the apex. So I don't count ribs, I don't eyeball nothing. I just feel where the heart is, and then I put my stethoscope right at the level of the precordial impulse. That's the left, the left apex. It's a mitral valve area. At the left apex, S1, so the lab, if, the, if it's true that the heart makes a sound that is lab dab, it's written in books. Sometimes it doesn't quite sound like that, but if the lab is S1, it's much louder than the dab, which is S2 at the apex, and that helps uh, double checking that you are at the apex. Uh, I listen carefully to see whether or not there is any abnormality, which could be a murmur uh, or a triple cadence, so an extra sound beyond the lab and the dub. And then what I usually do with a sort of a zigzag mo motion, I go one intercostal space cranial and a little bit dorsal, and then another intercostal space cranial and a little bit dorsal, to the point in which uh, S2 becomes louder than S1 or peaks in its intensity. It really, the chest conformation varies so much 
uh, um, you know, among breeds and species and the like, that uh, going based on a roadmap, uh, it's, it's just not reliable. It's much better to base your, your auscultation and your systematic approach on this, this kind of protocol. The apex is an objective finding. Unless the patient is obese, in which you can't feel the heart, uh, it's usually really very, very objective. This is the, ba the apex of the heart. And that spot, S1, should be louder than an S2. Then you move obliquely, cradial dorsal, until S2 peaks in its intensity. That's the base. That's where you will hear events related to the aortic and pulmonic valve. And then, if you keep going in the same direction, same oblique direction, you get to the axillary region, not to miss the PDAs that are one of the most common congenital heart defects in dogs. Then we move to the right hemithorax. Uh, pretty much on the right hemithorax, it's hard to say where you want to be. It's hard to feel the heart. The heart should not be palpable on the right. If it is, it's usually a problem. And uh, thereby, you pretty much go at the level of the olecranon to the point where the heart sounds peak in their intensity. And that is hypothesized to be the tricuspid valve area. So anything you hear at that level is most likely originating from the tricuspid valve. And then you repeat the whole procedure using the other function of the stethoscope. I usually start with the, with the diaphragm. And of course, if you start with the diaphragm, then you have to repeat the whole thing with the bell to avoid missing air, uh, low frequency heart sounds. Then as a final step in this approach, I go back to areas where I think I detected some abnormalities for several reasons. One is that there are artifacts in auscultation, respiratory artifacts, motion artifacts, you know, the noise next door that sounds like something real, but it's not. And so you want to make sure you confirm. So I think I heard, I heard a murmur there. You go back and you want to find it again. If you don't find it again, uh, you know, it, it should consider an artifact as, as a cause for the first, uh, the first abnormal findings. Um, and it's also important to recognize and acknowledge, and this is a limitation, unfortunately, inherent to the, the way cardiac disease manifests itself, that many audible events are intermittent in nature. So don't feel bad if someone hears a gallop and then you go there back and listen to the dog or the cat, you know, can't hear it anymore. Chances are that if you're doing your auscultation as it should be done, it's supposed to be done, uh, it, 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 we're actually dealing with an intermittent uh, event. Intermittent events can be due to intermittent arrhythmias, uh, something, like, something that sounds like a triple cadence, but it's actually an arrhythmia, can be an on-off phenomenon. Uh, soft murmurs can wax and, wax and vanish. So we can hear a murmur when the patient is first very excited, then the patient acclimatizes the room and the murmur goes away. And even gallop heart sounds can be intermittent. Now, one of the most important problems with the uh, auscultation is uh, feeling comfortable grading in the intensity of a murmur. It's a relative problem because I can't think of a situation in which really the intensity of the murmur ch completely changes the way we treat the patient or we approach the patient. Um, there are just very limited situations in which the intensity makes a difference in terms of decision making um, from the clinical standpoint. But, uh, you know, Having trained three generations of, well, three, three classes of students, the, the, the most common uh, complaint is uh, it's, all ob it's all subjective. That's partially true. It is all, it's a lot subjective. However, there are some objective aspects to grading a murmur, and I will try to emphasize them to you. So uh, we should all stick with the grade, with the scale uh, one through six without using the scale to five or four or your personal scale um, because it's the most widely accepted scale that, that developed by, by Levin a bunch of years ago. Um, in this scale, a grade one murmur is the softest murmur that can be possibly heard by human ear. But it has a feature that you are not supposed to hear it immediately when you put your stethoscope there. It takes usually several heartbeats for your brain ear combo to get to the point where you appreciate it. So if you put your stethoscope on the chest and you hear a soft murmur, it cannot be a grade one. It has to be at least a grade two, which is immediately heard. That's the definition. So if you go to the apex, you say, oh, there's no murmur. There's no murmur. Oh, wait a minute. I think I hear something. Chances are that's a grade one. 